the St George Cross on their shirts, following different teams in different ways and behaving violently. Is this a prophetic vision? Do you think, would you, would you describe it as that? Yes, I think it is a vision of what might happen. Um, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think there are tendencies in that direction. During the World Cup, looking at all those St George's flags flying, a series of football matches are summoning up the kind of national energies and conviction that you only get in the time of a world war. There's something, something going on which suggests that people are hungry for a more disciplined society. I mean, shopping is quite a disciplined activity. There's something of the political rally, Nazi style, about, you know, about a big shopping mall, lines of neatly aligned counters, the slogans, the expectations, the sense of, you know, these are ceremonies of mass affirmation, where we, society, affirm in what we believe, and we believe that so-and-so washes whiter. I think there's a danger that consumerism, to keep going, may need something more violent and dramatic. You know, it's like what William Burroughs said about heroin. You know, heroin is, 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 is the only product, uh, you know, which you sell people to rather than selling it to people. And I, th I think that that's what Ballard believes has happened with consumerism. But as ever with Ballard, this is not to be taken as a necessarily a negative statement. You know, it's got its upside. It has its own strange potentials. What Ballard sees as the future is boredom reaching the point where it has to be rescued by terror. It's, it's a voyage into madness. This book seems to be preaching insanity. I mean, he's saying that Essentially, we've, we've gone insane, but we, we've gone insane in a way that leaves us as a, as a tranquilized robotic state. Let's break through that. Let's start assassinating. Let's reenact the Kennedy assassinations in shopping centers. In Kingdom Come, the, uh, the main protagonist changes from being someone with whom one's certain sympathetic. He goes to find out how his father was shot and killed in this great mall. But then he actually begins to manipulate it. And he turns it into a semi-fascist state, and we don't quite know what to make of what he's doing there. It's very interestingly confusing at that point. Various people in the book, various characters, say, fascist? Where are the ranting Führers? The reply from, from a psychiatrist who's concerned about all this is, you know, we don't need a ranting Führer. Our Führers will be afternoon TV cable channel hosts much milder and a sort of fascism light but it will it draws on the same impulses but in kingdom come as in several of your other books we've talked about the resolution and the solution seems to be a mixture of erotic violence well, you're still with that obsession aren't you i'm not sure you know if england say in 2006 is all that sane and happy a place. I think at heart, you know, there's a tremendous boredom that people swage by shopping, and there's a, a lack of direction that people believe in nothing. You um, think boredom is dangerous, don't you? Boredom is dangerous, and believing in nothing is very dangerous. We all need to keep our eyes peeled for that man at the roadside with a sign saying dangerous bends ahead. So do you see over 50 years your books which have uh, a great inner cohesion sometimes use the same, the, the same characters, the same names and so on and so forth. Do you see them in one sense as cautionary tales? Yes, I think, I think they're all cautionary tales uh, in a way. I think they're all extrapolations from, from tendencies that are present. I mean, these are not long-distance prophecies of the, of the kind that Aldous Huxley and Orwell produced in Brave New World and, and 1984. They're short-term prophecies, looking at the next five minutes, in a sense. He's a man who's quite willing to say the unsayable. He, he, he says all the things that are most politically incorrect, most dangerous, most demented. Now, you don't know when you see the planes going into the Twin Towers or you see 
Diana's car crash, journalists are straight onto Ballard as if he has somehow caused these things by getting into that wavelength so many years before and describing events before they happen. For somebody who believes that the writer's project is to invent reality, I think Ballard has invented the reality that we live in. You cannot say of any other novelist, I think in the world, let alone England, that they have been capable of perceiving uh, as kind of congruent entities such phenomena as global warming and environmental disaster generally, the rise of the cult of the celebrity and its implications for mass psychology, the realities of the modern world, of what technology actually did deliver to the world and to England in particular. And, and yes, I would stand by the assertion that he's the most significant post-war English novelist. And to adapt to something you yourself said, do you think you've been faithful to your own obsessions? And if so, what would you say they were? I watched my obsessions develop over over 50 years as a writer, and I'm very lucky that I've been able to express those obsessions as a writer. I mean, had I decided to be a, a, a psychiatrist, I might have been able to do real damage. I'm obsessed with a sort of nagging need to find the key to a sort of central mystery, which I've never really identified. And I think it's probably something to do with my life in China. The images of, of Ballard that, that, that stay in the mind are, are all from the internment camp and from Shanghai's post-imperial grandeur left to rot. These symbols of emptiness and decay and so on very much move him and he, he invests them with a great deal of feeling. When Empire of the Sun appeared, for those of us that were already steeped in the fictional oeuvre, it was like encountering this kind of primary map, whereas I suppose for other people who, who weren't equated for his fiction, it was, you know, reading a book about a boy in an internment camp during the war. I believe all excuses. I believe all reasons. I believe all hallucinations. I believe all anger. I believe all mythologies, memories, lies, fantasies, evasions. I believe in the mystery and melancholy of a hand, in the kindness of trees, in the wisdom of light. When I was a child, I found Shanghai a complete mystery, the way in which reality could change overnight. That reality was just a stage set that could be swept aside that all the certainties of my life, all the adult certainties that I looked up at, um, that gave me a sense of security, were, in fact, paper thin on them, completely treacherous. Nothing was to be trusted. And I, I felt an obligation to try to, a sort of almost a small boy's need to find out what on earth is going on. You know, peep through the letter, see what the adults are getting up to. And I knew, that, you know, you couldn't trust the adults. They didn't really know what they were doing. Um, so it was left to me to sort of have a stab at it. Thank you very much. And that Melvin Bragg interview with J.G. Ballard will be available as a podcast from tomorrow. That's at itv.com slash southbank. <laughs>